right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is George Cruz, and you know, as I, I started, I'll just remind you Every month I do a town hall at a different library. We scatter them throughout all the different districts and all the different libraries, give everyone an opportunity to, to come to someplace close to their house, close to their employment, or some people just tour around and, and come to multiple. Uh, this is the first one of the second round, so we're here next month, August. Uh, we're going to be at Brave River, so it's right around the corner, so another one in close proximity. And then we're going to start bouncing, I believe it's uh, Rocky Bluff in September, and then Island Branch in October, whatever it is. It, I, I post them up on Twitter, and post them up in some other places. But none of this is geared towards me really saying anything. It's, it's not a, a speech, it's not a presentation. It's literally making myself available for any questions you may have, I'll halfway answer, any comments you may have, any Anything you want me to look into uh, over the course of the past few months, there's been a number of things people have asked me to look into, and, and I have. I've been terrible at getting people's contact information, so if I looked into something for you, you may not know I looked into it, but I did. Uh, I meant to bring a sign-in sheet this time, because I didn't last time, I forgot. But um, but this time, if you ask me specifically to, to do something or look into something, I'll, I'll get your name and email address afterwards. So I can at least get back to you and acknowledge that we are moving something forward. So with that, I mean, this is, the start of the second half of the year. Uh, recess ended Monday, and we went back. So a lot's gonna happen at the second half of this year. I'm gonna kind of touch on it real quick. The, between now and December, this board is finalizing the budget and the millage for next year. We're picking a new county administrator. We're presumably going to discuss impact fees. Uh, we're going to work on starting the process of rewriting the comp plan and the future land use map to better align with what the county looks like today. Uh, there's, there's a lot of big topics coming up in a very short window of time. Not to mention the fact that as of next Monday, one of our seven commissioners will be retiring, uh, in which case that seat, District 5, out by Lakewood Ranch, is going to be replaced by uh, and appointed by the governor. At some point in time, before anyone asks, I have no idea who that person is who's being appointed. I have no idea when that is. So it could be Tuesday, it could be November. I have absolutely no idea. Sarasota had, Sarasota had the same situation, unfortunately due to a death of, of Commissioner Peters. Uh, that took about two months uh, to get a replacement. So I don't know the timing, but until that period of time, we're gonna have a six person board. So uh, fortunately, it's probably not gonna end up with a lot of three, three ties. It's just gonna be a lot of five, one votes. <laughs> Which will make me feel a little better, <laughs> percentage wise. But, uh, but with that, that, that's pretty much where we are. This is the first, the, the, the start of the second half of the year. A lot going on, but again, this is literally for all of you, not for me, so I'm not going to speak anymore. I'm just going to open it up for questions or comments. And Larry, you're going to Yes, sir. Okay, Commissioner, District 5, uh, have they is, have to resign from District 5, or can the governor appoint anybody in the county? An appointment does not have to reside in District 5. In fact, the appointments for Nancy's seat, or Commissioner Peter's seat, Senator Deardsy down in Sarasota did not reside in that district, still does not reside in the district. That seat's up in 2024, so to the extent Neil wants to rerun for that seat, which he does because he already filed, he has to move into the district. You have to you have to live in the district to be elected into it. You do not have to live in the district to be appointed. Yes, ma'am. How's the progress on the utilities? Are they still Well, there's no negotiations to keep bills down at this point in time because they're going to be over. We, to, to do a quick, for people who weren't paying attention because it's not exactly the sexiest thing in the world, uh, we have to, we, we have contracts, they're typically seven to ten years, with, there's basically five major waste haulers around here. Um, so we have long-term contracts, it's, it's a flat rate, so you know what you're going to pay month by month, year by year for your garbage pickup. Our contract expired three years ago, and we had three one-year extensions. We kicked the can down the road over and over and over again and used all three of those extensions. So earlier this year, we had a new 10-year extension brought to us, uh, which I made a motion to approve so we can just be done with it, make sure your garbage is picked up because I'm not gonna have everyone have garbage in front of their house while we, we 
argue about this, like New York City and other places have had in the past. The decision of the board was to sign a two-year extension to kick it down the road a little more, and then start the process of renegotiating a long-term contract once again. Uh, that extension was finalized back in the spring. It doesn't kick in until October 1st, or maybe like September, but around October 1st. We are having a work session next week, I believe Tuesday. Um, the entire work session is just on solid waste. Uh, not just about this contract, but about the landfill and future intents of the landfill, etc. So at that point in time, we'll be finalizing the discussion of agreement to sign the extension, which at this point, we literally have no option but to sign that extension because there's no time left to do anything otherwise. So come Tuesday, we'll finalize. The reality is, and I kind of said it when it first came up, the extension essentially is the same as, you're gonna end up paying the same in the extension as you're gonna pay in a long-term contract. That's what happens, it's a short-term extension. So you're not saving any money by, by doing it all you're getting, the only benefit you get from this extension for two years is we're not changing service. So I'll use rough numbers because a lot of other pieces in here. You were paying about $9, you're gonna be paying about $14. The long-term contract was like 14 bucks, but it was once a week pickup, it was automated pickup, it, it limited yard waste and bulk. The extension still has the old services. So you still have twice a week pickup, still have manual pickup, exact same. You won't notice the difference in October as last October. <clears throat> but you're just paying the same $14, the same increase. At the end of the two years, or during the course of that, we'll be negotiating a long-term contract, and then I expect to see some of those services go back to what we discussed. So our bill's been about $5 for that. What about the water part of it? Water is a wholly separate thing. Water is something that we But change. they come on the same bill. For now, I'm trying to change that. <laughs> um, water rates adjusted back in the spring, three or four months ago maybe. Uh, we already adjusted those on a two year cycle. I try to make everyone's life easier by just adjusting it on a five year cycle so we don't have to keep bringing this up. But the agreement was to do it on a two year cycle and then revisit, so that's already been adjusted. Yeah. And honestly, it's probably not adjusted enough. Uh, nobody likes paying more, but there's lots of inflation and the reality is we can't be the lowest cost provider of everything until things break. You know, there's some quality of life that needs to be expected. There's a cost to a quality of life. We've kept water rates the same for like eight years. And then you see pipes falling off of bridges going out to the island. You see issues with just the ability to keep the lights on. We are actually running up to a point where we have a lot of bonds to fix a lot of our infrastructure. And they have covenants with debt service coverage. We have to have a certain amount of revenue in exchange for a certain amount of debt service payments for interest on those bonds. If they get too close, we default on the bonds, it blows up our credit rating. We were getting dangerously close to that. We had to increase rates. And even with the increase in rates, we're still about half the cost of water of Hillsborough and Pinellas County. We're still the cheapest water anyway. And we've avoided defaulting on our bonds, which is a good thing. Are you still planning on doing unlimited service for uh, all collections at the end of two years? I don't know, it's two years away. Um, I can only guess based on the current conversations when we first were talking about the, the long-term contract. The long-term contract, when we were discussing it before we decided to do the extension, switch to the discussion was once a week garbage pickup instead of twice, uh, automated pickups of more similar to what we do with recycling, uh, limiting yard waste to I think it's four cubic yards per week or whatever it was. Um, eliminating free bulk pickup, you can just call and there would be a schedule of what you pay for it. And eliminating the free 10 yard dumpster once a year. For eliminating all that's what kept the cost reasonably low. Uh, that was the last discussion, but again, it's a discussion that's gonna be had over the course of the next two years. It all, it, it all matters for price. We, ideally, we'd rather have more service than less service. I'd rather have twice a week. I'd rather have unlimited, but it's a trade-off of cost. And yeah, it's a trade-off of who uses it. The reality was the yard waste pickup was almost exclusively used by landscapers, not by the person who owns a house. Four cubic yards of, of yard waste is massive. I mean, there's houses you can rip out all the landscaping, it doesn't take up four cubic yards. And you can do it every single week. 
the free bulk pickup is unheard of in the state of Florida. I think we were yeah. one of only one or two counties in the state who had free unlimited, where you can literally put a refrigerator out on the curb and I'll pick it up for you. And the dumpsters were almost exclusively used by contractors and slumlords that were ripping stuff out of their house after a, a tent run. How many people knew you could just call and get a free 10 yard dumpster delivered to your driveway once a year for free? Well, by, for free, meaning everybody in Manatee County paid some proportionate share of it because your rates were higher for even having that right. So the intent was to make it a little bit more equitable in exchange for keeping the cost a little lower. But that was the, the discussion six months ago. What's the discussion going to be in two years? It really comes down to the cost. All right. You came just for that one question. You could have emailed. No, I was just wondering. <laughs> yeah, Going back to solid waste, I, I haven't kept track of what's going on with like getting a new landfill with all the development and all the easement. Is there, can we block more property for a landfill before it gets built up all around it? <laughs> and then people complain? <laughs> we, we have not. Uh, in fact, that's going to be Tuesday. We're having that exact discussion <clears throat> Tuesday at a work session. This has been something we've been reserving for it. We've got. 35, 37 million dollars in reserve geared up. We've been reserving piece by piece. So it's not a finance thing. It's a matter of, we need a minimum 1,100 acres, possibly more. You have to do it someplace where there's not existing residences around it. There's a lot of rules from federal and state and EPA. There are some other scenarios. There's things we can do to our existing site to extend the life. There are things we can do with other sites. There's things we can do in county versus in another county. There's partnership. There's a lot of options. I actually just had a um, fairly long briefing with our utilities this afternoon right before coming here and we discussed all of those options they're still tweaking it so I don't want to misspeak and say something that's not going to be on the final product but come Tuesday we're going to be discussing some of those options in a work session but it is we have about 15 to 17 years left in this landfill and it takes like 15 years to permit a new landfill <laughs> we're at a point where we really just you know have to make a decision about what we're going to do because we need the time to, to get that done. Plus, so much development is north of the river, and all of a sudden you have waste falling and having to haul all this stuff. Well, we're never going to have two landfills. <laughs> That's impractical. I mean, once you, it, it's it's a big process to shut down a landfill. Once it's done, you have to monitor for 50 years. So, yes, there's a lot of development going north of the river, but most of our residents are still south of the river. So. That's the trade-off of everything. That's the trade-off of where do we put the MSO for the sheriff, where do we put our, our government systems, where do we put our landfill? We're spreading out. And so you have growth over here, but you have existing residents over here. What's really the city center, the county center now? It's slowly shifting. I mean, back in the day, we're, we were kind of in right now, the county center. Way, way back in the day, because everything stopped at 75. And slowly has been trending, and now the county center is on the other side of 75 and it's gonna start trending up north. So who knows where the ultimate outcome is. That, that's a little less of a concern. Yes, the further you have to drive, the, the more of a pain it is. But we're also breaking it up to having a north section, a south section with two different waste haulers. And then there's some things you can do with transfer stations and stuff. So those are some things. Cool. Um, I used to live in Port St. advisory board, especially the bigger ones listed on there. 
now all of my town halls are finally on there. Um, and Amanda Ballard, District 2 Commissioner, her town halls are on there. So it, it, it's fairly robust in terms of a calendar. You just have to know to look at it. There are some places. You go to the Bradenton Times, for instance, every Sunday they, they do a week in government or whatever they call it, and they kind of list all the major meetings that are going to happen the entire week um, relative to coffees and things like that. That's just an individual decision. It depends on who's sitting in any position, whether it be mayor or commissioner or, or you name it. Like, I come out and do these every month, um, and then I try to make myself available at chamber events and other things. Commissioner Valor does the same. Some of the district commissioners go to HOAs and go to other things. It, you know, from a state level, Tommy Gregory, who, who represents like Lakewood Ranch area, he does Tuesdays with Tommy during non-session non times at the station 400. Everyone who's elected has the opportunity to do as much or as little as they want. I mean, and, and there's no requirement that we can say, you're forced to go out and have coffee with everybody. It, I would encourage you, do you live around here? Yeah. Okay, so you would be Mike Ron in, in Mike Ron's position. I would encourage you to reach out to Commissioner Ron and they would say, yeah. Yeah. get out of here and talk to me. Yeah. You, and then you. Okay. Um, the parking garage that they're going to build out on the island. Uh -huh. Um, who's going to have access to that? Is that being built for tourists or for people who live here in the county? We haven't even had that discussion. I can't, and first off, it, it, it'll be built for, in theory, for everybody. But we haven't even had that discussion. August 14th, see, I'm filling your calendar as we go here. <laughs> Next Tuesday is, is, is waste haulers. Uh, August 14th, they added a work session called parking garages, and there was an F at the end, so I'm guessing it's not just about the problem parking garage by the county building, I'm guessing it includes that one for preliminary discussion. Um, what that's gonna look like, what it's gonna cost, when it's gonna be built is entirely up to them. All we've gotten to on that is a bill was presented by our local delegates up in Tallahassee to request the right to theoretically build a parking that got signed by Governor DeSantis in June. So it took effect July 1st. So as of July 1st, in theory, we got right out there with a the shovel and just started digging a hole. But we need board approval. And there's lots of other steps. You can't just build something next to a beach. There's environmental issues, there's flooding, there's stormwater issues, there's cost issues because it's not cheap to build anything right now. So where's that money going to come from and what's the trade off? What are we? taking dollars away from. Our CIP is robust, but it's full. So the question is, if I'm spending, I, again, just numbers I've heard, the same numbers you guys have all heard, we all read the same papers, you know, upwards of $45 million, well, that's gotta come from something. Um, so there's a lot of open-ended questions. And then it comes down to, is it paid parking or free parking? Is it local parking or tourist parking? Who knows? When they built the parking garage in downtown Bradenton, when the city of Bradenton they worked out a deal with the hotel, and the first floor of that's for the hotel. That was the unique court that was that was done to them. I don't know what we're going to do with it. We haven't even had the first discussion yet. All we know is the bill was passed, which allowed us to theoretically have the discussion. I don't know what it's gonna look like inside. It just seems that if these things are being paid for with taxpayer dollars, that those of us who are paying taxes should get some kind of a break on it rather than paying the same amount as the tourists coming into town. Sure. I, I don't have an answer to that, because I don't know. I mean, what, I don't know what the break is. If it's not paid parking, I'm not going to pay you to park there. I mean, <laughs> if, if it's free, it's free. I can't make yours 10% more free. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be paid parking. And if it is, if we're going to outsource it and allow some third-party parking garage company to come and build it themselves in exchange for revenue streams, like they do with toll roads and bridges. Honestly, don't. I honestly don't. I tell you all everything while here. I, if I knew, I would tell you. I don't know what, what it's going to look like. But doesn't the, doesn't the um, beach renourishment come solely from the vet tax that you pay by visitors? Mm -hmm. No, that's not true. Beach renourishment mainly comes from state and federal dollars. The parking associated with that is we're required by law to, to in order to get the beach renourishment dollars, we have to have a certain number of parking spaces within a quarter mile proximity of beach access to qualify it as a public beach to allow for the public dollars to be spent. Um, some of our, our bed taxes do in fact go to it, but I mean, you're talking like a million bucks out of 30 million bucks. It's coming from other places. Number one, 
Number two, I stay in hotels here. Most a lot of people have stayed in hotels. It's not all tourists it's funny that, that go to tourists a lot. And honestly, we've taken our tourist development taxes and figured out how to twist them into some big projects instead of sprinkling them over little projects. I mean, we're doing a massive renovation and expansion of the convention center. And a huge percentage of that is coming from tourist development taxes, which is going to limit the future uses of those taxes until some of these big things get done. We're contributing to the moat rebuild. We got the convention center up here. We just started sailing a couple of boats down the river. Um, we're working on some stuff with over by Leecom. A lot of those tourist development taxes are kind of pre-accounted for at this point in time. Yes. All right, two things. Okay. What is the, what's it called, address to get that county information on your computer? Email address, I guess, or whatever. Oh, top of my head. Uh, MyMenatee.org is the general website. Um, from there, there's a government, under the government tab, there's a county calendar section that has the whole calendar. Oh. Number two, a while back, I heard that uh, they're going to be selling off the main library and moving it so that the town could reap some benefit of water and property. They're not thinking of closing any of the other libraries, are they? We're still having that discussion. I'm going to propose it. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, Boom. <laughs> First of all, I'm the most outspoken. I'm doing my tunnels in libraries on purpose right yeah. now. <laughs> I'm the one who pushed the hardest to get the Lakewood Ranch Library built. I, I'm doing yeah, well, all these at libraries. This is a very active little library, and I volunteer here. I, I, I and I see a lot of the people, and they enjoy it, and I'd hate to see it closed down. I, I, I wouldn't be concerned about any other branch whatsoever being closed. In fact, we're building one right now. So, um, so would the Manatee Main Library on Central, down on Bach Road, would that be God willing, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Here's here was the, the proposal I made, and it's just my proposal. And the city the city is selling city hall because our downtown is massively underutilized, almost to a, a criminal extent. And then everyone complains that everyone keeps building further and further and further out east, and we're only. 20 miles from Iaca at this point. <laughs> so far away. Uh, like we keep going further and further east because people keep, we had 25,000 people move here in the past two years. Yeah. And so we keep building further and further east and further and further up north. Nobody should be building in any of those places ever, not one house. We should be building real structures by redeveloping along 14th and along 26th Amen. and downtown and over on the Palmetto site. We should be building for height and density in your existing infrastructure and existing utilities and allowing people to bike and walk to work and hop on a transit to get where they're going instead of driving on my roads. That's what we need to do. But to do that, you need the redevelopable land yeah. to do it. And it's all well and good saying, go go build over there next to that old car wash or that old tire place that, that may be a brownfield. But where do people really want to build their biggest structures, their, their highest tax base structures, bring the most revenue in? It's going to be near the water. That's the same thing in Sarasota with the Quay. That's the same thing with St. Pete along their waterfront. So right now, our waterfront was a hospital, a city hall, a library. Like, this isn't best use of that land by any stretch. So my argument was, my argument was, everyone gets this great. My argument was very few people need 25,000 square foot library. Because this isn't like back in the day where you pulled out the Dewey Decimal System, you walk the stacks. That, that's now I use the library all the time. I have like two books checked out right this minute. I go onto my computer and I say, I want this book and I want to pick it up at Rocky Bluff. Two days later, I get an email. I walk up to the whole thing. I grab the book and walk away. That's that's my involvement in that library. And honestly, ninety percent of the stuff I check out is on Libby, and it's a Kindle or it's an audio book. It's not even written. so. We, what people use these libraries for is meeting spaces. Computers, periodicals, and then we have all these great STEM centers and electronics and things like that. that's that's what a lot of the people are using it for. My art, my we have some my great clubs in here. Now. We do. I said meetings. So my proposal was instead of a twenty-five thousand square foot building on the water, which could be 
repurposed and resold and get lots of residences down there and get retail down there and restaurants down there right. and help create a vibrant downtown. And then get five 5,000 square foot libraries, but put them where people actually want them to be near their proximity. I already talked to people downtown about getting space downtown. So there'd still be a downtown presence down there. That would still be the core library. But put one over where Wakeland is right now. Put one down in Oneco. Put one in San Jose. That, those are the people who need to come here and have their kids use our STEM centers to, to enhance their learning. These are the people who need to come and use the computers and want to read the periodicals. I'd rather have satellite, and in fact, if you look, and I've talked to commissioners all over the state, and I've talked to people in other states, a lot of counties are going in that direction and having outpost satellite library systems. There's whole companies that reach out to me that will do that for you, and that's their proposal, is to make it more tech-focused, smaller footprint libraries where there's more branches to allow them to be closer to neighborhoods in closer proximity to people. My proposal isn't to do it all around town because we're a very car centric. We're a very car centric town, so we don't need to do that down in, in other parts. But I don't want my downtown to be car centric. I want my, I want my downtown to be walking centric, bike centric, and transit centric. And to do that, you need to provide things close to where people work and where people live. And you do that by having the, the smaller thing. So that was my proposal, strictly for the, the central library, was to break it up into smaller pieces and better utilize both from a tax base standpoint and a living standpoint, a vibrant downtown standpoint, because once that gets built and the city hall gets built, then you're gonna start seeing other stuff get built. And as more people move there, there's gonna be more restaurants, grocery stores, more people are gonna rebase their employment centers down there because that's where their employees are living. I was you're going just to see concerned that you would be closing some of the smaller libraries. No, no because you can't, okay. because, because this, this you can't make this area a walkable area. That, that ship has sailed. You can do that downtown. You can go from the water to Lee Com Park and from 13th over to 9th. You can still make that a, a walkable. And up in Palmetto, you can do it from 8th over to 10th and from the water to Sutton Park. Those two areas could create a very large, very vibrant, very dense downtown area if City of Bradenton and City of Palmetto would, would start working that way. And City of Bradenton is. They're talking about an overlay for zoning to allow for that. City of Palmetto right now is not, but I'm working with them. Be what? honest. I'm sorry. Be honest about this. You're talking about closing a 1,500 square foot library or a 20 story condo building. I mean, come on. You know as well as we do. That's what's going to happen in City Hall. And then there's a hotel room and there's going to be another 20 story condo. You may disagree with my opinion, or you may disagree with my preference, but I'm certainly not, not being honest with you. I can tell you one blank what I would like to see with that library is a 24-year-old. And who's going to be able to afford to live there? Not the working person in this community. No, probably not. And, and also, I think that you're really kind of maybe forgetting or not paying attention to the demographic that goes to these libraries. They're not walking. They're not riding bikes. They're elderly people. My mom is one. And she likes that kind of old school, be able to go check out a book. She's not tech savvy. Does she, does she live immediate? Does she live immediately next to the central library? No. Okay, so then she rides. <laughs> what difference does that make? Well, that's pretty. She doesn't bike. She drives. <laughs> okay. She doesn't bike. Yeah. 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 And that's her favorite library. Okay. So I mean, she could go to five other libraries and live closer to the island. To be honest with you. Okay. Uh, but that's you know where she goes because there's more variety in hand. Okay. But yeah, condos down in the water. They're not going to be affordable. At no point in time did I say I was trying to rezone a library to create affordable housing. I, that, those words didn't come up. Huh? And I focus more on affordable housing than possibly every county commissioner in the state of Florida, and certainly every county commissioner here in Manatee County. I have, I'm not saying no. I'm, not saying I, I, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm, so I'm just saying. So I, it's not like I don't care about affordable housing. I'm the one who pushed to get a dedicated village for affordable housing. Yeah, I'm not saying right. you don't. Know. I'm just saying that particular project. Uh, Agreed. And I will. I will be the first to acknowledge that every square foot of Manatee County does not lend itself to affordable housing. Affordable housing is like where affordable housing is supposed to go. And literally, your most valuable piece of water from our. 
you go to you go to Miami, go to St. Pete, go to Tampa, go to Sarasota, go to, go find me, go find me waterfront affordable housing any place, possibly the state of in the state of Florida. You won't because that's not where affordable housing goes. I'm not arguing that this particular piece is going to be affordable housing. Just like I'm not arguing the, the city hall building is going to have affordable housing. Neither of Mark, but 920 is going to have some affordable housing, and Astoria is going to have affordable housing, and the Addison is. All of those are also downtown. They're just not on the water. So those are three different affordable housing projects I named that are downtown and are going to be walking distance to every amenity that comes in because of the higher income people that move into those condos, which are then going to lend the benefit of the, the of the employment and lend the benefit of the services and lend the benefit of the amenities. Downtown to the is going to benefit from that. No, I would not. One hundred percent guarantee. Yeah. No. Absolutely not. No. I think you better clean up before Chase Street. <laughs> I won't go down there. Are we going to talk about that? No, we're not. Uh, okay. Another time. <laughs> I, mean, I, I do want to talk about it. It's an interesting, it's an interesting it's an conversation. Cool. And it's an interesting, you know, we all have, like, you feel very adamantly against it. And I, and I understand yes. that. But also, when I listen to your presentation on it, it's interesting because I grew up in Sarasota. I've been in Bradenton for about three years now. But if I, if someone, if I'm, going to go to a downtown area of one of the two. I'll be honest, I'm going to Sarasota. I'm going to Sarasota too. Really? But, it, but, it's, but now I don't think it's all been redeveloped properly. There's a lot of, comp with old time, I've been in the area since I was four years old. So there's a lot, of, I don't like how they built to the street with zero landscaping and they took every inch that they could legally get. And I don't like, you know, these, these you've got a sidewalk and then you've got the building sign. I find that more developed, yeah, that's, that's, in my opinion. That, that's a preference. I personally like zero on one. Yeah. I think it's a cool aesthetic. Because I like parking being behind it. I hate driving down the road and just seeing parking lots all the way down the road and some building way step back. I much rather see the buildings put the parking behind it. I just think it looks nicer. And honestly, if you do eventually want a walkable community, zero lot line is the only way to go because people walk down the sidewalk and they walk straight into the restaurant. They walk down the sidewalk straight like nobody walks across the parking lot because people are whipping through parking lots. It's, it's statistical fact that, 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 that if you want a more walkable community, you cut the, you, you cut the setbacks off. That's just facts. Again, we're not getting a walkable community here, so I'm not, but, but, but downtown Sarasota is working on a walkable effect. At one point, they wanted to shrink down Fruitvale to one lane each way, just from 301 to 41, <laughs> because they were trying to create walkable. Yeah, but you go to downtown Sarasota, Right now, there's people walking on every square foot of that sidewalk. Walk around. You go to downtown Bradenton, there may be three people, and that's because one person's car wouldn't start. Like down, but downtown Sarasota, people are living down there. There's condos down there. There's office buildings down there. People walk out to get coffee. It's it's a whole different vibe down there than it is in downtown Bradenton. And honestly, I'd rather. I'm not saying we're ever going to be, nor do I want us to be, like downtown Sarasota. But I'd like to take some of the best practices of downtown Sarasota and incorporate them. To the extent I can, and I'm not the city of Bradenton, so I can't force them to do anything. But I do have the rights to a few parcels of land. So if I can contribute, then it's lending support to what I'm asking them to do themselves. Do you have more questions on that? I know I kind of no, no, I'm veered not off on you. <laughs> I'm all about the dogs. I know. I'm sorry about you. All right, George. Yes. Please. Two questions. So the library, yeah, first of all, the <laughs> so here's my concern. You, you got Ron Allen at Fox City Hall. He's going to put multi million dollar condos in there, some, <coughs> some, some uh, seasonal rentals. They're getting screwed here because the big developers are going to go there and make a million dollars. We have an opportunity right now to take that library, put it in the land trust, make a mixed use on the first floor, make part of the first floor, the, make it a library. What's so difficult about that? And then maybe we want to go up 20 stories, take the first three stories for parking, go five to 10 for workforce housing. You said they should be able to walk to work. I guarantee you, your, your staff cannot afford to live downtown. But you make, if you really want a truly mixed use, land trust, we always own it, bring in a workforce house developer, put the library on, keep the library on the first floor, build workforce housing, and then maybe the top five stores, you know, blow your minds out and build your condos and help me increase their costs. That's my thing. Never give up property to a private developer. 
my second question, which is more important, really scared the shit out of me. I think your first one was a question. It was a statement. Okay. <laughs> all, right. all right, so I would suggest to the board to put in a land trust at the first floor, keep, keep the library there. It's not, it's not a big ask. I think it would enhance the neighborhood, uh, and, and that, would, that would be my concern. Okay. My second question is, yesterday we rescinded the agreement between University of South Florida for the nine acres because they lollygagged on building that out for dormitory housing. It scares the shit out of what you guys are gonna do with it because again, that nine acres, I ain't no way, see that shit, that, that, that's that gotta stop. Right there on the water, you got, I told you yesterday, we have 30,000 students and a few hundred dormitories. That's prime property. I know everybody's fighting at the bit at it. That needs to go into an affordable housing land trust. And like I sent you an email today, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, because you sent me a bunch of emails. Professional oh. dormitory companies in this country, I, and they'll knock it out I, way I, faster while the board's taking three years. What, what should we do no, with it? No, they could have been built by now. No, no, you're, 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 I, I appreciate you thinking of all things, everybody. That, we have built, I, at no point in time have I ever pretended the government's role in life is to build this county does oh, not, has not, yet. and will never build student housing for a, a state university. That's not my role, to use your tax dollars to build student housing for a university that gets funded from the state who chooses not to build their own dorms. That's not the county's job at all. We're not building. You sent me the link to the company, that, I think it was earlier today, right? You sent me the link about the company who builds student housing. Good. Send it over to USF. No, no, we got the nine right. acres. We took the nine acres back. Okay, bro, build the student housing for them. I'm not building anything. We're not building. First of all, you, you know, your mindset of student housing. Our students are community, and they're gonna get thrown out the market rate right now, holding a job, doing 12 hours a semester, working their asses off. You know why? Because they can't find an affordable place to live. So yes, they are part of our community, and you need, and, and we should consider that when you put it in a land trust and earmark maybe three acres out for two or three dollars. I, I don't know where you think my mindset's out on student housing. I actually have like three months on student housing projects right now. Um, I never said anything about student housing. I think student housing is great and it's a money maker, especially with a big company. Uh, if they wanted to privatize it and have somebody come build private student housing and rent by the bed as opposed to rent apartments. Right. Um, those aren't cheap either. In fact, it's cheaper to buy to, to rent a place on, on North Trail down by the airport than it's ever going to be to rent a brand new student housing unless it's dorms. Dorms are built by universities using university funds or using state funds to build dorms for themselves. They, they, they're subsidized by your tax dollars that come through the state to the to the, the university system. That's how it works. I don't know we're doing the nine acres. We have reversion clauses when we give over property. We give people very flexible windows of time to do something with it. Otherwise, we've had situations, you know, because you've come to me on some of this property, and because your argument was, this church is just using it as a parking lot, it's supposed to be affordable housing, it wasn't, take your land back and give it to me or give it to affordable housing. You brought this up. So you agree with reversion clauses because you don't like seeing good quality, well-located property underutilized when someone takes advantage of getting free property from the taxpayers and not using it. That's all this was. There was a reversion clause. They had a window of time to do something with it. They didn't do anything with it. So by the letter of the contract, which we have to honor, they have to honor, it's being rescinded back. Do I care if we give it back to them again? again? No, I do think they need more. They have some student housing being built. That was not their groundbreaking last year. Um, so they are building some student housing, but it was the first student housing they've ever built in their entire history. It's certainly underutilized. Same thing with Ringling for that matter. Ringling has been renting and, and leasing whole apartment complexes right. on 41. Like, cause uh, Mark Vengroff's dad right. owned a bunch of properties there and they were leasing the whole property, fixing it up and using it effectively as dorms. It, it is a problem here. I happily revert that back to USF. If they came and said, here's my blueprints, here's my plans, can I please have my land back? I promise I'll do something with it. I'll give it back to them. I'm perfectly okay with them building dorms on that land. That's why we gave it to them in the first place. We clearly wanted them to use that other we wouldn't have given it to them. But they failed. So, okay. so that's it. Right. And, and, but, but prior to giving it to them, don't forget, it's just a beautiful piece of property as part of Pell Crossing. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically a nice, beautiful park. That, that's, that's, that's the ringling. 
right by Powell Crosley, right down uh, north of Ringling. It's like down 41 before you get to like the airport. Like right where USF is, you have USF, you have Powell Crosley. There was a stretch of like nine acres of very nicely wooded land that went all the way out to the water and back. We had deeded it over to USF for them to build dorms because they needed dormitories. Because right now they're effectively a transient uh, college. Like people live at home or, or go someplace and then they go there. They want to be more of a real university where people live on campus and interact with each other. They're building some dorms, but there are hundreds and hundreds of dorms under capacity once those are built. We transferred some of our land off of Powell Crosley. We didn't really need saying, here, take these nine acres, build dorms on it. They never did. So Can they determine whether they actually have a student population to fill the dorms? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That's the I mean, if they're transient students. But, they're they tra but, but the question is, well, again, I don't speak for you. I know they're actively building dorms right now. There might not be a need for well, that. You, 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 you got Ringling. You got 20,000 students. Yeah, it's a lot of educational facilities. New College can build a big dorm on top of a classic car facility. Yeah. Okay. You can either call it 15th Street East or 301, whatever you want to call it. By Woodlands, the assisted living, then the bay, something they'll be going in there. Is that 800? Units, affordable houses? Oh, that's, uh, that, that's California out there. Yeah, yeah that's, that's Lincoln okay. Avenue Capital. So it's two It's two different projects totaling about 592 units, I think. It's like 300 something units of family, like, like regular affordable. It's all affordable, but some of it's just regular family style, 